and then welcome everyone. Um, today's special topic webinar is hosted by West Virginia Developmental Disabilities Council, Disability Rights of West Virginia, and WV ABLE. So we are celebrating National Disability Employment Awareness Month which celebrates the contributions of America's workers with disabilities, past and present, and raises awareness of the employment needs and contributions of individuals with all types of disabilities. So we're excited that you're celebrating with us today, in which you will hear from each of our team of experts as they share insights on the importance of employment for individuals with a disability. So our panelists include Steve Wiseman with the West Virginia Developmental Disabilities Council, Jennifer Tenney with the West Virginia University Centers for Excellence in Disabilities, Rich Ward with the West Virginia Division of Rehabilitation Services, Travis Klein with Job Squad Incorporated, and myself, Roxanne Clay with WV Able. So our panelists will share with you how individuals with disabilities, including those receiving supplemental security income, can benefit from employment. They will discuss the services and the programs that are available to help individuals with a disability prepare for and achieve employment. You will also learn about how employed West Virginians with a disability can save and invest with WV ABLE while protecting eligibility for critical public benefits. So let me add, it is such an honor to have our panelists share with you today. They each bring many years of dedicated and valuable experience in their work with serving individuals with a disability. So with that said, I would like to ask each of you a question and I'd like for you to put your answer in the chat box if you would like. So please take a guess on the number of years of combined experience that our panelists bring to this webinar. Go ahead and an enter your um, guess in the chat box and we'll circle back at the end um, during the Q&A session with the answer. So the first segment of today's session, I will bring uh, provide just a very high level overview of WV ABLE Savings Program. And for those of you who are not familiar with WV ABLE, it is a savings and investment program that allows many eligible individuals with a disability to save and invest without it jeopardizing their eligibility for federal benefit programs such as SSI or Medicaid. So what is WV ABLE? It is West Virginia's ABLE plan. It is based on federal legislation called the ABLE Act that was passed in 2014. The bill created savings and investment accounts for individuals with a disability. Money that is deposited into this account does not affect eligibility for public benefit programs such as SSI and Medicaid. The program is administered by the West Virginia State Treasurer's Office. Our program launched in February of 2018, so we just celebrated our four-year anniversary earlier this year. WV ABLE is offered to the West Virginia residents through a partnership with the Ohio Stable Program. WV ABLE accounts, they provide financial independence for individuals with a disability. They provide new investment opportunities that they didn't have before. They also provide tax benefits. So the interest that is earned on the investments grow tax-free. Also, there is a West Virginia state income tax deduction for contributions made into the WV ABLE account by the West Virginia resident and taxpayer, and that is dollar for dollar. So who is eligible? The requirements include that the individual is a West Virginia resident and the onset of the disability would have had to have occurred prior to the age of 26. Now keep in mind, this does not have to be the onset of the diagnosis. This would include the onset of the symptoms. <clears throat> also, you do not have to open the account before the age of 26. And then we have one of the following criteria. The individual is eligible or entitled to receive SSI or SSDI due to their disability or blindness. Remember, you do not have to be receiving public benefits to be eligible for an ABLE account. Or the individual has a condition that's listed on Social Security Administration's list of compassionate allowances conditions or through what's called self-certification. And what this means is you have a written diagnosis by a physician of a physical or a mental impairment that causes marked and severe functional limitations 
and the condition has lasted or is expected to last for at least a year. So individuals can actually go to our website and take the eligibility quiz to determine if they're eligible to enroll in a WVABLE account. As far as enrollment, it is done online at WVABLE.com. It's relatively quick and easy, approximately 20 minutes, but often less than that. Um, there is a $25 minimum opening deposit to open the account. This is not a fee, it just creates the opening balance. As far as who completes the enrollment, it's either the individual with a disability, which is known as the account holder and the account beneficiary, or an authorized legal representative. And this would be in cases when the individual beneficiary is not able to open or manage their own account, for example, a child or an adult. Um, with a disability who either chooses not to manage or open their own account or they're just, they, they're not able to. So an authorized legal representative is defined by law as one of the following, an agent acting under power of attorney, a conservator or legal guardian, a spouse, a parent, a sibling, a grandparent, or a social security representative payee. As mentioned, stable accounts offer both savings and investment options. So when a contribution is made into the account, the beneficiary or the ALR will So an S investment options for the stable account include a bank safe option, which is 100% FDIC insured in which the principal is protected. And then we have four Vanguard mutual fund options that range from aggressive to conservative. So to learn more about the options, we encourage you to visit our website and the tab titled How It Works. Money in the WVABLE account must be used to pay for qualified disability expenses. And a qualified expense must relate to the disability and must maintain or housing rent, education, food, basic living expenses, the purchase of an iPad for child with autism for assistive technology, for example, um, going to the movies as it lends to building or maintaining the quality of life for the individual with a disability. So anything that benefits the child or the adult with a disability. Some important numbers and special considerations to keep in mind. and 0.33% and applies only to the earnings portion of the investments. For individuals that receive SSI, it's important they know that the Social Security Administration disregards the money in an ABLE account up to $100,000. Any amount above $100,000 is counted as a resource in which the money starts counting toward the $2,000 asset limit. And then new as of 2019, and I mentioned this, there is a West Virginia state income tax deduction for all contributions made into the WVABLE account by the West Virginia resident and taxpayer. When the account beneficiary passes, West Virginia Medicaid will not file a claim against the WVABLE account for any medical expenses that were paid out on behalf of the beneficiary. The only exception is if the expenses were paid for the individual living in a nursing home or a community-based waiver program, and they're over the age of 55. So for more information about that, you can go to westvirginiarecovery.com. As it relates to employment, the employed individual with a disability that owns a WVABLE account, here are some added benefits. The earnings from the employment can be used to fund a WVABLE account. So in addition to this, the 16,000 annual standard contribution amount that's allowed for all ABLE accounts, the employee beneficiary can contribute an additional 12,880 of their employment earnings, which brings the grand total amount for the annual contribution for the employed beneficiary to 28,880. Also, payroll direct deposit can be easily set up to make recurring contributions by the employed beneficiary. I mentioned the West Virginia state income tax deduction for all contributions made by the West Virginia resident and taxpayer. Of course, this also applies to the employee beneficiary. Employers can make direct contributions to their employees' WVABLE accounts. 
and individuals can save money in the ABLE account without it impacting eligibility for SSI and Medicaid. So we covered a lot of information in a very short amount of time. So I encourage you to visit our website, wvable.com to learn more. Here is a screenshot of what our uh, website looks like, but also make sure that the URL address does read wvable.com. On the website, you'll see a list of frequently asked questions, more detailed information about eligibility benefits and how the accounts work. Additionally, I do one hour recurring webinars each month in which I would encourage you to attend to learn more information about the accounts in more detail. You want to go to wvtreasury.com forward slash wvable, find the, the program resources button that takes you to this page in which you'll see the tab for learn more upcoming events and you'll see a list of upcoming events in which you can also register. So now let's move to our next expert panelist. We have Steve Wiseman, who will discuss the importance of employment for individuals with a disability. Steve has served as the executive director with the West Virginia Developmental Disabilities Council for the past 23 years. His prior positions include director of the West Virginia Division of Developmental Disability Services, director of West Virginia's Deinstitutionalization and Community Services Development Project, the Medley Project, and superintendent, director of adult services, and home-based training consultant for a county board of MRDD services in Ohio. As part of his responsibilities as the DD Council Executive Director, he has served on numerous commissions, boards, councils, and other groups focused on the development of quality community-based services for people with developmental and other disabilities. He is the past chair of the West Virginia Olmstead Council and the State Monitoring Committee for Transitional Group Facilities. He has served as a consultant for the Federal Administration on Developmental Disabilities and for the DD Councils in other, st other states several times. Steve also lectures in universities and other settings in issues, on issues that affect people with disabilities and other people who are devalued by our society. He has led several training teams in West Virginia, Massachusetts, and Ontario, Canada in the evaluation of human services. So welcome, Steve. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thank you, Roxanne. I appreciate that introduction very much. Uh, I just want to start off by saying how proud uh, the Developmental Disabilities Council is to partner with our sisters, the uh, Disability Rights of West Virginia, uh, the West Virginia ABLE Board, and uh, those other, and the panelists and who they represent today. Also, uh, all those panelists and people I mentioned are members of the uh, active members of the ABLE board, as well as members of the new state task force on employment first. So this is a very happy marriage of, uh, of these two programs and, and initiatives. So I wanted to dive into the question about uh, why is it important to talk about employment and employment for people with disabilities? <clears throat> I've listed here several things that are just common sense, but we take for granted as, as uh, other people, particularly people who don't have disabilities or don't have other um, situations, characteristics, and so forth that may be devalued in our society as a whole. I won't go through them all, but the most obvious ones sometimes are just material gain. People with disabilities uh, on average, are uh, much more impoverished than people who don't have disabilities as a general rule. So this uh, ABLE um, initiative that Roxanne described very well uh, certainly facilitates and makes possible not only gaining uh, financial resources, but how to invest and uh, maintain other services and supports at the same time. Some of the things I want to mention were uh, for people with uh, disabilities, particularly severe disabilities, sometimes uh, there's some real benefits to not just the job itself and the work uh, and the material gain you get from it, but also the routine um, that comes along with employment that we all have to do, but really do um, embrace, I think, over time. But it also uh, adds other kinds of non-material things, such as opportunities for positive relationships. 
Um, a lot of my friends and probably other people's friends have been cultivated at uh, the work site and people you know and things you have. And then you have things in common to talk about. It's a much more interesting and rich conversation sometimes. Uh, and people with disabilities <clears throat> who have been uh, sometimes sheltered from society as a whole, um, they're not only materially uh, impoverished at times, but also experientially impoverished. Uh, we need more and interesting things to talk about oftentimes if we want to get our place in society. Um, it does help one develop a positive resume, uh, literally and, and kind of figuratively as well, because um, it, it helps combat, as we'll show in a few minutes, uh, other kinds of negative uh, stereotypes and roles that people get cast into. So that's, a, to me, a very important aspect of employment, particularly as we're pushing competitive integrated employment. Um, so as I said at the end, it safeguards against stereotypes. At least it helps in a lot of ways. One of the things that I mentioned in here is a sense of standing, and people wonder, what do you mean by that? Well, we all take it for granted. Uh, we meet somebody new somewhere, and uh, once you get past the... Uh, you know, nice things about finding out what their names are, where they're from. And, and you say, well, what do you do? And people know, adults know, basically, what do you do is what do you do with your time during the daytime? Um, it could be answered a lot of different ways, but most people would answer, oh, you know, I work at uh, Union Carbide, or uh, I'm a teacher, or some kind of role relative to uh, employment, or I'm... Uh, I'm a house uh, keeper, or it could be any number of things, but it has some sense of, of uh, telling people where you stand, I guess, in society in general, for right or wrong. Next. So here's an example of a young woman who, uh, Savannah Eve, and uh, Savannah is, is showing her pride in doing a good job. Um, I'm sure she works for uh, material gain, like we all do, but uh, I, I think uh, Savannah impressed me as being a very conscientious hard worker. She happens to have a disability, um, but that's pretty secondary to her uh, work ethic and the kind of employee that she makes. I uh, want to do a shout out to uh, one of the panelists um, from Job Squad Incorporated who helped facilitate and support uh, Savannah and her family through this. But Savannah um, did most of it on her own. I mean, she's she's a very uh, driven person and um, does a great job uh, for the uh, FBI Center in Clarksburg. I mentioned about social valued roles or at least uh, some negative things. Uh, what What's a, a socially valued role? Uh, how's that in employment tied together? Well, Again, for working aged adults, there is a general expectation in society that people work and earn a living and uh, those are the things that come with it. But the roles that one can easily fill when they have a job is as employee, you could be a hard worker like Savannah was showing you right there visually, taxpayer, a very important uh, role in our society, able has come along and helped us with saver and investor. Those are roles that one could take. A contributor uh, goes well beyond uh, the work role, but um, in the work role itself, one's seen as being part of society in general, something bigger than yourself, and uh, certainly not uh, taking, but giving in a very formal way. You're an earner, a coworker. Again, very important with those relationship building uh, positive relationships at the work site <clears throat> and afterwards. Um, also, there are just a lot of others I threw in here, like a, a team player, a teacher. Once you know the job, oftentimes you're tasked with helping somebody else learn the job um, or something like that. And that includes people with disabilities who could be uh, great teachers of that. And the last one I put on there was employee of the month or year. I mean, those are uh, things that are earned, people look up to. Those are valued roles. Next. Oh, 
I want I wanted to follow up that last one with uh, 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 an old friend of mine, and uh, this, this slide's a little dated. I think it's now 19 years ago, but uh, Alan Elkins, a uh, person many people know, and uh, he works down in uh, Boone County where he lives, and uh, a diligent, diligent employee. Um, Alan wouldn't mind me telling you that he has pretty, uh, pretty significant uh, level of autism. Um, just one thing in his life, uh, but he has many other things, including, in, including a Corvette, I might add, um, which I saw the other day. Um, but Alan um, has worked his way up in the uh, Boone County Hospital and um, has uh, received honorary uh, awards of Employee of the Year, not Disabled Employee of the Year, but Employee of the Year. Uh, Again, um, he really took to the routine and to the uh, relationships being built on the, on the job site. Uh, he's also amassed some material wealth of sorts with it and uh, has used the uh, ABLE account uh, quite well. A, a great role model too. So there are many, many other people. I just plucked out a couple people that I happen to know uh, pretty well. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm sure folks probably have some questions and comments. You know, if you want to save those um, until the end or include those in the chat, we'll certainly um, circle back. So let's go ahead and move to our next panelist, um, Jennifer Tenney. She is with the West Virginia University Center for Excellence in Disabilities. She will share her insights on employment for SSI and SSDI beneficiaries and why employment is always the best choice and why. So Jennifer Tenney has served in the field of employment for people with disabilities for over 18 years. Ms. Tenney is currently the primary investigator of the Social Security Funded Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Program. It's a grant program here in West Virginia at the West Virginia University Center for Excellence in Disabilities. She is considered a subject matter expert in the area of working while receiving federal Social Security benefits. Ms. Tenney received her undergraduate degree from West Virginia University and earned her master's degree from the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, I'd like to talk today about um, being employable while um, receiving SSI. And um, I know a lot of people have a lot of questions um, and call me often about being employed and um, how can they be employed and have SSI. Um, so before we even start, let's talk a little bit about some of the myths that people believe about social security and working. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that you can work and receive some or all of your disability benefits. It is possible to work um, both in receiving SSI and SSDI. We're going to focus on SSI today, but in receiving both benefits, you can work and receive some or all of your disability cash benefits. Um, so it's not, you're not going to lose everything that you've worked so hard to receive once you think about going to work. Also, working and maintaining your health insurance is an option. Um, Social Security has built in work incentives for those who are working to be able to keep their health insurance. Um, at least for a little while, if not indefinitely, um, while working, um, as so long as you meet certain criteria. Um, working while receiving SSI is always financially better. And if there's nothing else that you take away from today's conversation, please hear that. Working while receiving SSI benefits is always financially better. Um, when we talk about adding in 
other benefits, it can get a little muddy, like SNAP benefits and HUD benefits. But if you just look at SSI benefits, which we will look at here in just a minute, I'm going to show you that you will always be financially better off working. And finally, one of the things that I want you to know is if you choose to live solely on SSI, you guarantee that you live a life lived below the poverty line. Um, and I, I especially want our younger folks to hear that because that's not something that we want. Uh, nobody wants to live below the poverty line, especially our younger people who are just starting out in the world and getting ready to um, start their jobs and, and start their lives. So um, it's really important to understand that if you live a, on, on SSI, you will live a life of poverty. Next slide. So let's see how we can work on SSI and get more money. So let's look at Gabriel. And Gabriel is a 34-year-old gentleman who has been living on SSI for many years. He lives at home, but he pays rent to his parents. He has a job offer working 20 hours a week at a local engineering firm making $10 an hour. And everybody's question is always, how will his benefits be affected if he takes this job? So we're going to look at how this happens. The first thing that we're going to look at first is how much will Gabriel make at his job? Gabriel will make approximately $866 each month before taxes at his job. Everything Social Security looks at is before tax wages. So we're looking at 20 hours times $10 an hour times an average month of 4.33 weeks equals $866 of gross wages per calendar month. And Social Security looks at when we got paid each month um, versus when we got we earned the money. So we look at when did you actually get your paycheck? So we're going to look at now how it works with that long um, calculation worksheet. So I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of math with me here in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. All right. So the first thing that Social Security looks at is any unearned income. Unearned income is anything that Gabriel might be receiving that he is not currently working for things like SSDI or black lung benefits or railroad retirement benefits, anything that Gabriel is receiving that he's not currently working to get a paycheck for would be considered unearned income. Gabriel doesn't have any, so we can skip that line and go straight to the next line. Gabriel, remember, we said made $866 at his job. Um, he is too old for a student earned income exclusion, which is the maximum age of 22. And so we have a remainder, again, of $866. Next slide, please. The very first thing that we do is we take a $20 general income exclusion. Social Security says, Gabriel, we're glad you're working. We're going to pretend like you did not make the first $20 of your income. So Social Security is not taking that money away from Gabriel. They are pretending like he didn't make it. So we subtract that $20, and then we subtract a $65 earned income exclusion. So some of you providers may hear from your beneficiaries, I can't make more than $85 or else my check will be reduced. And that is true. 
once your check um, has been reduced by that earned income exclusion and general income exclusion, the next thing we have to look at is we divide by two. For every $2 that you make, $1 comes off of your SSI check because SSI is designed to pay for food and shelter. And Social Security says if you are working, you should be helping to pay for your own food and shelter. So they are going to take away some of your food and shelter monies and make you pay for some of your own food and shelter. But they're not going to take away all of your money. And we're going to see that in just a minute. So of the $866 that Gabriel made, we have a remainder of $390.50 after we divide by two, we subtract $85 and divide by two. Okay, next slide, please. We don't have any blind work expenses because Gabriel is not a blind individual. So the last thing we have to look at is how is Social Security going to adjust Gabriel's check? The base SSI rate in 2022 is $841. That's the most that anybody in the entire United States can get on SSI. So if you think about people who are receiving SSI, if you are receiving SSI and you are in Clarksburg, West Virginia, you're receiving the same amount of SSI as someone in New York City or Denver or Sacramento or Los Angeles. So the money is not designed to help you live a life of luxury. It's designed to pay for your food and your shelter. Again, so $841 is the maximum amount of money that anyone can get on SSI in 2022. We have to subtract not what Gabriel actually made of $866, but we're going to subtract what he, uh, Social Security is going to count of $390.50. So we get an adjusted SSI payment of $450.50. And always when we get here, people start getting a little nervous because their SSI check is going down. When you work on SSI, your SSI check will always go down. But what you have to consider is the bottom line. And if we look at the bottom line and take our adjusted SSI payment of $450.50, that should read 50 cents, excuse me, and we add our $866, we get a subtotal of $1,316.50. We don't have any expenses that we have to subtract from that. So we have a total financial outcome of $1,316.50, which is $475.50 more, more than if you weren't working at all. So see, I just showed you that if you weren't working, you'd be making $841. By working, 20 hours a week and making $10 an hour, you're going to have $475.50 more each month to put in your wallet to help pay your bills, to do the things you need to do. Now, keeping in mind that we want to make sure that we watch how much we start saving, and we're going to talk about um, how that will roll over and, and talk about um, how that will mesh with the West Virginia ABLE account in just a minute. Um, but for now, 
we have more money working. So the math always works. Next slide, please. Some really important things though that you need to know. You absolutely must report your wages every month. And there's lots of different ways that you can do that. You can report on an SSI app on your smartphone. You can call in the telephone reporting system and I've provided you the number. You can fax in your pay stubs to the local social security office. You can mail them into the local social security office or you can walk them in in person. Um, in order for you to use the app or the telephone system though, you must provide social security with your employer's EIN number in order to get things set up so that you can do that. It's fairly easy to do. And once you get it set up, all you have to do is plug in the numbers on your app or call in the telephone reporting line and you can report your wages that way and you'll get a, um, a response um, number back that you can write down so that you know that you've reported your wages. Again, I said SSI adjusts your check based on when you were paid. And SSI always adjusts your check two months in arrears or behind schedule. So what you make in October does not really adjust, does not really affect your check until December. And that's because Social Security allows you to work in October. They they uh, get your checks in November, they adjust them, and then they issue your December check. So it takes a couple of months for Social Security to adjust your check. Um, and there are other work incentives that are available for people who are on SSI to work to help keep additional SSI income while working. It's really important for anyone on SSI to talk to your local work incentives, um, planning and assistance, community work incentives coordinator. That would be myself or my colleague, Josh Kelly. Um, there will be a slide at the end of this block of presentation to give you um, contact information on how to get a hold of us. Um, we're free service and we will help you understand how your check will be affected, your specific check, and we will also help you um, keep in, up to date on when to report wages and um, when to do the things that you need to do for social security to keep everything um, from getting out of hand or getting an overpayment. Next slide, please. Okay, 1619B. I want to quickly talk about 1619B, which is their health insurance. Um, 1619B is your um, keeping Medicaid keeping Medicaid while working on SSI. Um, if you're working, um, Social Security says that you must have some money from SSI in order to keep um, your Medicaid, unless if the only reason that you're not getting a check from SSI is because of your income from work, and we can say yes to the, those four bulleted points on the screen. So you remain disabled, need Medicaid to work, meet your asset and resource limit of $2,000 a month, and stay under the annual income limit of $35,120 in 2022. You can keep Medicaid even if you're not getting a check from Social Security through a program called 1619B. And this program can continue year after year, okay? 
So this is a program to help you keep your Medicaid, even if you're not receiving an SSI cash benefit. And this is when you would be making enough money that your SSI cash check would go to $0. Okay, it does happen. I have a lot of clients who are on 1619B and making good money. Um, being able to work and keep their health insurance um, and work just under that $35,000 a year mark um, and keep their Medicaid just like they would have regular Medicaid and not have to pay for it. Social Security continues to pay for their Medicaid. Next slide. Uh, finally, we want to talk about West Virginia ABLE and how that works with SSI. Um, it's a protected asset, like Roxanne said earlier, allowing for more than $2,000 a month to be in the account. Um, so folks that are working and making a good bit of money can put the, more to, than their $2,000 a month in assets and resources into their ABLE account to help them save for things like homes, vehicles, um, things that they may need for the future, dental work, um, you know, any qualified disability expense. And it just allows beneficiaries of SSI to save above the resource limit and stay eligible for SSI and Medicaid. So West Virginia ABLE, um, was the best thing to happen to SSI um, as, in, as far as being able to save, allow people on SSI to save money, um, to be able to, to purchase the things that people um, without disabilities or people on SSDI can save for. Um, and just do the things that, you know, people who um, are working do, save for homes, save for cars, um, you know, do the things that people who work do. So um, next slide, please. All right, so my takeaway message, work is always financially better on SSI. And I showed you how that happened with the math. Report your wages every month to prevent an overpayment um, through the app, the phone system, faxing, mailing, or in person. SSI checks are adjusted two months behind schedule. And if you lose SSI eligibility for the month due to excess resources, so if you forget to put money into a West Virginia ABLE account for that for a month and you're over resourced for a month, you also lose Medicaid eligibility for that month. So you will lose your health insurance and you will lose your money for your food and shelter for that month. Now you can get back on the system um, within a year. But my point is you don't want to lose your health insurance. You don't want to lose your money for your food and shelter. So don't take a chance. Always open a West Virginia ABLE account. Always fund that account with extra money so that you're not worried about losing those things. Next slide, please. And this is the final slide I just wanted to provide. Um, it is a way to contact us at the, at the WIPA program. Um, you can call us at that number. That, that extension rings right to my desk um, and we'd be happy to serve you. So um, thank you again to Roxanne for this opportunity to talk and um, give some information on SSI and working and how it um, dovetails with West Virginia ABLE. Thanks, Jennifer. I always learn and pick up on something when I hear your presentation that I didn't pick up on the time before. And we do have a 
a question that we will save until the end because the question that's being asked is probably one that other people are wondering as well. Okay. Um, but again, any other questions, feel free to put it in the chat and we will circle back at the end. Um, I'm glad for folks like Jennifer and your colleagues that can help keep all of this straight for us and do the math. And your takeaways are incredibly important to make sure that folks are actually um, reporting their income every month. Um, they certainly don't wanna lose their benefits and especially those Medicaid benefits. So thank you, Jennifer. So now let's move on to our next expert panelist, Rich Ward. He is with the West Virginia Division of Rehabilitation Services, and he will discuss vocational rehabilitation services. Richard Ward graduated from Glenville State College in 1996 with a BS degree in behavioral science and an AS degree in criminal justice and began working as a licensed social worker providing in-home family preservation and therapeutic foster care services. He began working on a master's degree in community agency counseling at Marshall University. And upon completing that in 2001, he started providing intensive in-home therapy to at-risk children and families. He also worked as a middle school counselor and as a licensing specialist for a therapeutic foster care agency. Richard began working for the West Virginia Division of Rehabilitation Services as a rehab counselor in October of 2004, providing vocational counseling to individuals with disabilities, helping them achieve positive employment outcomes. He later began working as a supervisor for DRS, overseeing three vocational rehabilitation offices. He is currently serving as a statewide program specialist for Division of Rehab Services in the areas of behavioral health, corrections, and community assets. Richard provides technical assistance to vocational rehabilitation counselors who are helping individuals with behavioral health conditions, as well as individuals with disabilities and criminal histories um, that obtain and maintain positive employment outcomes. He serves as the agency liaison to various partner agencies and works to provide information about the services that DRS provides. Rich will share his expertise about these services with you now. Thanks, Roxanne, and um, sorry you had to read that very lengthy um, biography. And uh, also thanks, Steve and Jen, for your, your great information. So yeah, once uh, an individual uh, with a disability has decided to work um, or decided that they, that they want to go to work, I think a great place or a great resource to start is with us at the Division of Rehabilitation Services. It's our mission over here that together we enable and empower individuals with disabilities to work and live independently by pro providing individualized services to consumers and employers. And the point here is that we don't do it alone. Um, we work with uh, our, our consumers, the employers who, who hire our individuals, and all of our valuable partners that are um, here today. Um, next slide, please. So, um, yeah, so uh, in order to be eligible for services, you have to have a, a physical or mental condition that interferes with your ability to get or keep a job. I want to be clear, though, that, that you, if you're an individual that receives Social Security disability benefits, for example, you're going to be automatically qualified for our services. But in order to apply and be eligible for our services, I want everyone to understand that you do not have to be receiving uh, Social Security disability, and you do not even have to have uh, documentation of a physical or, or mental condition. If you suspect that you have that condition or you're struggling because of a suspected condition to get or keep a job, we can help you get that information that we need. We can help you with evaluations and link you to, you know, whatever it is that you need to get um, uh, the, the documentation that we do need. Uh, we help adults and high school students with disabilities ages 14 and up to set their work goals, develop career plans, and to help them overcome any employment-related barriers so they can go to work or maintain their current employment. Next slide. So this slide just covers a, a very wide array of services that we do provide at, at the Division of Rehab Services. It's important to say that, that all of our services are, are, are unique and, and tailored to each individual's needs. Not everyone gets all of the services that we can provide. Uh, you, 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 know, you get what you need to, to help you maintain or obtain your employment goal. 
Some of the services that we do provide, though, are work-related counseling and guidance. Uh, we provide vocational uh, education and medical and psychological evaluations. A lot of those are to help individuals with the eligibility determination process. Um, it's important to, to know that um, there are many pathways to employment. You know, once you've decided that you want to work, um, th there are lots of options uh, towards employment. There's on-the-job training, there's vocational school, there's business schools, there's college training. Not, you know, not everyone has to go to college or, or does go to college. You can, you can obtain great jobs um, through many different ways, but, but we can help you select what is the best way, and we can help you often pay for those trainings uh, that you might need. We do work site assessments and accommodations. Uh, we, we help with employment-related services like job searching, uh, resume writing, interview skills development, uh, a, wide, a wide variety of those types of services, assistive technology, um, computers, any type of uh, assistive aid that might help an individual overcome a, a barrier, um, driver's uh, evaluations, vehicle modifications, you know, all those different services medical or psychological treatment that an individual may need to, to be able to prepare to, to enter the workforce, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, hearing, um, things that may be needed. Um, and then we also provide uh, pre-employment transition services specifically to our, our transition age youth population. Again, those folks 14 to 21. Uh, again, with counseling on job exploration, um, post-secondary education opportunities, workplace readiness, and instruction and self-advocacy. So those are just some examples of services that we, we can and do provide. There are some steps in the vocational rehab process. It, it is a process um, that, that sometimes um, can be lengthy because we provide a, you know, the, such a wide array of services that we might be working with an individual who's in school for multiple years. So sometimes it takes, you know, it takes a while for an individual to achieve their employment outcome. But the first step is to apply for services. That's, that's really a, a simple process. Um, the second step is uh, you need to be evaluated to determine if you do have a disability. Uh, then we're gonna wanna, after you have been determined eligible, we're gonna work with you one-on-one -on -one to develop your plan for services. We call it an individualized plan for employment. And it just lists out all the services that you may need to achieve your employment outcome. You know, what goal have you selected to achieve? After that's done, we move towards, you know, providing those services, linking you and, and coordinating all the services that an in individual might need to um, uh, achieve their outcome. Once that is done, then we move to the, you know, obtaining the employment piece, the most important piece of the process. And after that's done, you know, we consider that uh, vocational success, but that does, that's not always the end of it. We want to monitor you and stay with you and make sure that you're satisfied with your employment, that the employer is satisfied, and that um, you are ready to maintain that job, you know, uh, on your own. And uh, something changes, and you know, we can always start over. Individuals can come back and reapply. It's not a one-time, you know, deal. Next slide, please. So, what is special about uh, the Division of Rehab Services? Again, we provide those one-on-one -on -one services. We work to protect your privacy. Uh, we help you achieve your work goals. We help you realize the rewards of work. And Steve talked a lot about that. And the, the rewards of work are independence, reliable income that, that Jennifer talked about, and, and just the personal satisfaction. Uh, Steve great, gave great descriptions of how all those things are important to individuals and important in our society. Work is, is, um, work is what we do. So we want to help individuals with disabilities achieve those work goals. Next slide, please. Just wanted to go over just a few of our uh, accomplishments in our last uh, physical year. This is the most current uh, data that we have, but last year in, in physical year 2021, DRS served uh, well over 6,000 West Virginians with disabilities uh, through our vocational rehab program. Over 4,000 of those individuals were transition-aged youth, and, and Jen mentioned, you know, how important it is to work with youth and, and helping them realize that, you know, employment is, is definitely an option and really should be the, the, the route that everyone goes. Um, in that year, we purchased over $14 million worth of services, those different services that I mentioned. Um, we, we purchased those services uh, to help all of our consumers receive uh, or achieve their goals. 
we work with 63 acknowledged community rehab providers. And in a minute, you're going to hear from one of those uh, providers. Um, I really like the way Roxanne set this um, the webinar up. It just kind of works through the whole process of, of working towards employment. So I think she did a great job with that. But um, more than 1,000 of our clients are potentially, potentially, potentially eligible students received one or more services from, from a, a community rehab uh, provider. And we uh, purchased over $2 million worth of those services in uh, 2021. Next slide. So accessing services. Uh, services, I just wanna, want you to know services are out there. We have 26 offices across the state. We can meet individuals in their local communities. Uh, we have counselors assigned to every high school in the state of West Virginia. We have a website where you can get information. There's a, a, a link you can click on and uh, contact us electronically. All of the field office numbers are on our website. So I would encourage you to you know, go to that website, check it out, educate yourself about what services are available, and then contact us when you're, when you're ready to go to work um, and start that process. Just, just reach out to your local office or our, our state office so we can connect you with the right, uh, right people. Next slide. And that's for Travis. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. Um, I have to say that as I was listening to your presentation, um, you had sent out an invite to yesterday's um, Ability to Work Recognition Ceremony from Division of Rehab Services, and I was able to attend. And it has to be uh, just incredibly humbling, but also exciting to see the end picture of the individual that has went through all the steps from the very beginning. You know, they've worked um, again, you know, with with yourselves, with community rehab professionals. You know, there was a, an individual who had who's working at Job Squad, another one with Goodwill, um, and of course, there's a lot of, of of agencies like that. But it just has to be so rewarding to see the end picture and to see these individuals thriving and just um, employed and happy. And one of the key words that was brought up yesterday was the word per perseverance. And that's the one piece quality that they all have in common. So um, I just, you know, commend your work as well as everyone, all of our panelists, because it, it takes a village to, to help help individuals, you know, to reach their full potential. And, and I just think it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. So Thanks, Roxanne. It wasn't that a great ceremony, and those those individuals are are wonderful. And, yeah. and just real quickly, there's nothing more rewarding than a, to a to a vocational rehab counselor than having your consumer or your client that you work with receive that honor. I mean, that's that's um, that's really an incredible thing. And I was so fortunate one year to to have that. Um, so uh, you know, I feel like that's the the top of my career. Once you have someone uh, that you've worked with achieve that uh, award, yeah, it, it's it's all downhill from there. So. It's a great honor. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it was it was really evident, to, and it was often to be able to see it firsthand. So, congratulations. So now we will move on to Travis Klein. He will discuss the employment opportunities for individuals with a disability, what services are available, and where to find them. So Travis Klein is the CEO for Job Squad Incorporated. We just mentioned them, and has worked for the company for over twelve years. Travis is a graduate of both West Virginia University and Fairmont State University, earning a BS in psychology and a master's in business administration. Travis has worked with individuals with disabilities for over 15 years and has significant experience advocating for people with disabilities to obtain competitive and gainful employment throughout West Virginia. So I'll turn it over to you, Travis. Thank you, Roxanne. So, so today, so far, we've heard from, from Steve. He discussed the, the value of working, right? The social values, um, building self-esteem, and how that can help a person with disability grow. Um, we had Jennifer, did the, she did the math for us, right? How typically, no matter what, um, you're going you're gonna to end up ahead um, if you're working, even if you're receiving some type of Social Security income most of the time. And then we had Rich to, to describe DRS, West Virginia Division of Rehabilitation Services. So I'm going to kind of just take, take over right from where Rich left off, and we're going to talk a little bit about DRS, go into a little bit more de, um, 
deep dive into how DRS works with CRPs like Job Squad um, and, and other other CRPs across the uh, the state. So, like Rich said, you know, we're, DRS helps individual disabilities establish and reach their vocational goals. Um, like the services that he talked about, you know, evaluation, restoration, transition services, um, reaching kids in high school, uh, vocational training, assistive technology tools to help them be successful in the job, and then of course job placement assistance and, and job coaching. You know, after they do get that job, um, and so what happens is DRS, you know, they have the counselors like Rich was talking about, sit down, go through the application process. Um, and then they, they have their own counselors. They also have employment specialists that can help. But what they also can do is, is refer individuals with disabilities out to what we call community rehabilitation programs or CRPs like Job Squad or Pace in Morgantown, Goodwill, um, Restle Nesbet Services, Gateway Industries, just to name a few. <clears throat> and, and so then we, we work with those individuals to help them provide services, which we'll get into, I think, in the next slide, and then also with the ultimate goal of, of finding a job and being successful, hopefully independently. Um, I think also Rich already also mentioned this, but DRS maintains um, 30 offices <clears throat> organized into six districts throughout West Virginia. And you can find your local office by visiting their website at www.westvirginiadrs.com. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So when we're talking about CRPs, these are typically nonprofit corporations whose mission is to provide employment and training opportunities for individuals with disabilities. CRPs provide various services that are authorized by DRS, like we were just talking about, but also through, through Medicaid as well. And these services could be training, career explorations, assistive technology, customized and supported employment, which we'll, which we'll discuss here in a little bit. And also um, some CRPs are state and federal contractors that provide products and services to our federal and state governments and then employ individuals with disabilities on those contracts. We can go to the next slide. So let's first jump into some of the training and skill development programs that could be available and that we typically find here at Job Squad are very helpful um, for people with disabilities. So the first one there is a life skills training. <clears throat> what we're talking about here is more in the longs of, of interpersonal skills, um, money management. So some of our staff can, can meet with individuals. We can, we can discuss about um, writing checks, how to balance your checkbook, um, you know, bank accounts, how to deposit, you know, saving money, budgeting for your, your expenses. Um, we also can talk about personal appearance, right? We all have to maintain some type of appearance when we're going to work, right? Whether it be a specific type of uniform, making sure we're um, presentable uh, before going to work. Um, we can also talk about emergency and safety skills. Um, other community resources are available. Uh, housekeeping, um, taking care of, of, you know, washing your uniform after work, um, taking care of, of, of things outside of work to, to make sure that you are able to then focus on your work while you're at your, at, at your job. And obviously, the big elephant in the room um, in West Virginia is transportation. I mean, I think feel like we always have to discuss this. Um, unless you live in Morgantown or Charleston or Martinsburg or you know one of the other cities that do that do have public transportation, um, you know, and even those cities, you know, the, the bus is not running twenty four seven typically. So so we do have to 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 try to figure out transportation issues to get people to and from work. One of the skills that that we typically provide here at Job Squad through DRS is is work adjustment training. You know, this is a system of goal-directed training focusing on one kind of specific area that the person with disability might be struggling with or not, might not understand, um, such as attendance. Um, you know, some people with disabilities haven't worked. And, and so the ultimate goal is to work 40 hours, maybe be full-time, but, you know, work stamina might be an issue. So we got to work slowly, you know, working 10 hours a week, slowly building up to those 40 hours a week. Um, punctuality, dress and hygiene. Um, how to interact interpersonally with your coworkers and your supervisors um, and getting along uh, in the workplace. So we can do trainings and, and scenarios like that. And also one of the big things I think really helps um, individuals with disabilities is work exploration type services. Um, DRS calls these community-based assessments or CBAs for short, um, but basically these are designed to introduce um, individuals with disabilities to types of work that are available in their, in their community. Um, 
So for example, if, if Job Squad gets this type of referral, you know, we, we, we've been doing this for a long time. So we have people with disabilities that we have helped get jobs in our communities. And so we have developed relationships with employers and we have, you know, many, many sites um, based upon different industries and interests that the person with disability might have. And so we can go and visit those sites. Um, you know, we could, we, we could set up informational interviews with the manager or the owner of the business. So we can, we can ask things and we can try to drill down to maybe what that vocational goal might be. It's like one of the, one of the things that we, we get is, oh, I like computers. I really like to work with computers. Well, that's a pretty broad vocational goal. So uh, work exploration can be very beneficial in, in going and visiting like an IT firm or something like that. So we can ask questions. The person with disability can ask questions to that site. We can see the work that's there. And one of the neat things we were able to do as well, a lot of our sites will allow us to um, do some of the work there right on the site with, um, with the person with disability while they can make um, um, typically a minimum wage um, while they're trying out that job for a little bit. And sometimes those, those trial work periods <clears throat> end up working into, into a, a full-time job for that person. You can go to the next slide. Okay, um, next slide here is about customized and supported employment. Um, you know, customized employment is basically an individualized process uh, involved with, of a couple of different services. We'll start with the first one, which is discovery. And this means trying to find out about the person with a disability. Here at Job Squad, we talk about everyone's personal genius, um, something that they're good at, or what if their interests are. And this looks different for everybody, right? You know, some people with disabilities, you know, might've had previous jobs, they have a resume, they come to us, they're able to verbally tell us what their interests are, what they've done in the past, and we, and we, can, and we can move right on. Um, you know, some individuals just really have communication um, delays or, or barriers. And so, you know, we might have to think about that differently. We might have to have the parents involved or friends and, and maybe we're seeing what chores they do around the house or in their group home. Um, and then, um, you know, one instance, I know we had a person who had been um, only receiving day habilitation services probably for about 25, 30 years. So had really no idea what was out there in the community, really hadn't done any type of vocation, pre-vocational type services or any work before. So, um, you know, I remember one of the things that our career counselors did with, with him and his family was every weekend they went to, there was this place in, in, in Fairmont called the Valley Worlds of Fun. Our career counselor just went there. Um, with the family and watch that client interact with the, with the people at Valley Worlds of Fun, um, and see how they talked with people, what happened. Um, and that situation ended up with that person getting a job there at Valley Worlds of Fun, you know, about six to eight months later. Um, he, he ended up retiring, retiring from that um, organization before they, before they um, closed their doors. <clears throat> so once we, when we just get the discovery process and, and, and understand what type of work they're looking for, what their interests are, then we're trying to match that up with an employer in their local community um, for a job matching. Um, and sometimes that can be a little bit different too. You know, we can, we can, we can talk about negotiated work tasks or job carving. So maybe we have one job, you know, like a cashier or something like that. Um, but our personal disability maybe can't do every single aspect of that job. Uh, so, so maybe we need to negotiate with that employer, like, well, we can do, you know, some parts of the cashier job, but then we need to supplement with some stocking of the shelves or something else. We want, really want to drill down to the work duties and customize them with the employer to make sure the person can be successful on the job. Um, social capital we have listed here. Um, everyone's heard the cliche, it's about who you know, right? And, and this is kind of what this encapsulates here is, is that um, part of the discovery process, what we're also doing is trying to find out where the person with disability and their family spends their time, who they know, like, like the, in the situation we just talked about with Valley Worlds of Fun. You know, if there's already a place where they're spending their time um, and they already have relationships built, let's go see. Maybe that can, can work into a job there or somewhere else. Um, so, so getting to know the, the person's um, social network and, and who they know in the community can also help us um, to locate a job for that person. And then job coaching also. So the ultimate goal, right, is to have the person be independent in their job without any support. But sometimes, you know, we have to have what we call job coaching ahead of time. So job squad will have a, 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 a staff member go with the person on the first few weeks on the job where we're helping them um, learn their job duties, um, being a li liaison with the employer, 
um, helping the employer figure out what training needs might be, might be helpful to the person with disability to make sure they can have the most success on the job. And then slowly, we want that job coaching to fade out, where maybe we're only checking in once a week to see if things are going okay. And then slowly fading out to hopefully that person can, can do uh, the job independently on their own. But DRS knows, and, and the employer always knows, that they can call Job Squad back. If the person gets promoted, you know, something changes. They get a new job there. We'll always will come back, um, figure out if we need any new assistive technology or training methods to help that person be successful there. So what we're doing is really individualizing the employment relationship between um, the job seeker and the employer to hopefully make sure it's a win-win situation for both, because that's going to be the best success for long-term employment for that person. <clears throat> and typically, these jobs are, are in our locally community, community owned businesses in our local community. Okay, Roxanne, we go to the next slide. Um, okay, so the, so the best outcome is when the job is negotiated based on the employer's need and the ability of, of that job seeker. Um, you know, we we want to avoid any type of segregated settings that can be detrimental to teaching and learning. Um, the best place that, especially here we, in Job School, we found is to learn is the environments where targeted skills will be utilized. And I think we've seen this in research too, and we're looking at the education where kids in schools, if, if we're taking the tests um, and, those, and those types of things where we are learning those skills, they're going to perform better on those tests as well. So how, how's that going to be any different in the, in the employment situation? And the last point on this slide is that <clears throat> the job retention and satisfaction for both the job seeker and the employer increased when, when, when we're looking customized employment and supporting employment, when we're really individualizing the process and the program. Because like we said, every, every, everyone is not the same. Everyone grew up differently, have different backgrounds and different interests. So we really want to have the long-term success, to make sure it's individualized for, for that person. Okay, so earlier I talked about how some CRPs are involved in government contracting. And we'll start with the West Virginia State Use Program here first. Um, this program assists people with disabilities to establish and reach their vocational goals. Well, actually, wait a minute. It looks like we have the wrong thing here. So I'm going to ad lib here a little bit. It looks like I messed up on this slide. But basically, the State Use Program is a program that was, that was I think, developed in 1984. Um, and, and basically, it provides that any type of products or services that the state government is trying to purchase in the open market, they must give first priority to um, organizations like Job Squad that are, are employing people with disabilities um, on these jobs. So for example, here at Job Squad, we run a pre-sort mail business down in Charleston where we provide um, all the mailing services for our state. So we go to the state capitol multiple times a day, pick up all the mail, bring it back to our facility where we sort it, get it on pallets and then take it to the post office in the, the day for the state. And we employ about 30 to 35 individuals with disabilities doing a variety of jobs down there from, from truck driving to machine operating, mail clerks um, and supervisors. And there's CRPs all across the state that are doing things like this as well in, in regards to laundry services, custodial services, ground maintenance services. Um, there's a CRP that does um, water cooler deliveries and, 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 water, and water deliveries um, for the state. So there's lots of different services there. Let me go to the next slide. Hopefully the next one is accurate here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this one is the Ability One program. This is what's on the federal side. So it allows CRPs to provide products and service to the federal government while employing people with disabilities. There are 4 billion of Ability One products and services were produced by the federal government, or procured by the federal government in fiscal year 2020. And we're talking about things like American flags. I know there's a CRP in Utah that makes American flags uh, for all military bases, ships, and, and those types of things, uniforms, furniture, office supplies. One of the major office supply companies in America, uh, Skillcraft, is a um, NIB agency, the National Industries for the Blind. Um, producing pens, <clears throat> then there are uh, Ability One Source America producing um, nonprofit. Um, and we also provide janitorial services and other facility maintenance. This is what Job Squad does. We have a contract with the FBI here in Clarksburg where we, where we employ over 80 individuals with disabilities, providing <clears throat> all kinds of facility maintenance services for the FBI. We take care of over a million square feet of office, office area for them and over 90 acres. Um, we're mowing grass, landscaping, trimming trees. Um, they even have a, one of those green living roofs. We, we get on the roof and, 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 and trim um, uh, the roof and take care of that for them as well. Some other um, CRPs, uh, I think Payson Morgantown works with the Department of Energy and NIOSH. 
um, and Job Squad also works with uh, um, the General Service Administration, cleaning some federal courthouses and U.S. Marshal services in, in certain areas of West Virginia, all, all, <clears throat> all providing jobs for people with disabilities. Okay, so we can go to the next slide, Roxanne. Okay, well, that's it. I guess we're done. We'll go to the questions and comments. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Travis. And, and I hate to put you on the spot here, but several things what you said just rose a question for me. So as it relates to Job Squad, you know, at any one time, like how many individuals with disabilities are you all employing? And maybe even over the, the lifespan of the organization? Just curious. Sure. So um, we currently right now have about 160 employees and our overall ratio company-wide is 92% is of people with disabilities. So I'm not, I'm not gonna do the math in my head there, but, um, and it's all across, it's not just, it's supervisors. My project uh, manager at the FBI who's, who takes care of all the surfaces out there, supervises all 80 employees. He started out as a substitute custodian, as a person with a disability himself and has worked his way up to be the general manager of all services out there. Wow. And then as far as all the CRPs combined, I mean, is there any data out there that, I mean, I, I know it's an incredible amount. That's a good question. You're putting me on the spot and I do not have oh. for that one, Roxanne. Okay, I'm right. sorry about that. Well, I just know it's a lot. I mean, we, we know this to be true, so. Yes, yes, hundreds, yeah. hundreds for sure. Yeah, well, this was, incredible, valuable information that just helps to put it into perspective. I always learn when I hear from you all, you know, about the CRPs and of course Job Squad. Um, yesterday, one of the individuals that was an award recipient was a Job Squad um, employee. And so I'm sure that's um, just brings a lot of just pride, but also yeah, it's just it's just a wonderful thing to see. So yeah, yeah. Well, she's not a job squad employee. I think she works for a community business. We just support her in a okay. community business there. Yep. Gotcha. So it's all interconnected, though. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. And I think pretty sure she started as a DRS referral that uh, even another CRP worked with originally. Mm -hmm. That we came in to provide the job coaching and support once they once she had the job. Okay, very good. So let's, we have about 12 minutes and we do have some questions in the Q&A. So let's go ahead, I'll leave this. Okay, let me mention this real quick too. All the, the slide deck for today's presentation, every uh, registered participant will receive this slide deck via email. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the slideshow so we can have all of our presenters um, be visible so that we can, <clears throat> excuse me, Go ahead and, and advance to the questions. And the first thing I want to mention is, you know, I had asked the question about, you know, our participants taking a guess about the accumulative number of years of experience that our panel has in working with individuals with a disability. So um, we had 100, we had combined 80 years, we had 110. So, so it is right at close to 80 years of combined experience. Um, that we have with our panel. And so this is, this is um, again, just a real honor to have them to share with you about their experiences, about their expertise. And so let's go ahead and jump to the questions. Um, we have Hunter Starks that had a question for Jennifer. And is the 1619B similar to or different from the MWIN, which is the Medicaid Work Incentive Program? Sure. Um, 1619B is different than MWIN. MWIN is our Medicaid buy-in program. So MWIN is for folks who do not qualify for 1619B anymore or may not qualify at all, um, have ever qualified for 1619B. People who um, qualify for MWIN do not have to be receiving SSI or SSDI. Um, they have to meet an SSI level of having a disability, but DHHR can make that determination without having um, Social Security make that determination. So, um, and with MWIN, you purchase Medicaid versus 1619B, you're getting Medicaid services as an SSI uh, recipient. 
So that's the difference between the two. Um, and when you're purchasing your Medicaid 1619B, you're still an SSI recipient. You're just not getting an SSI check anymore. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and sure. let us know if that helps to answer your question. Um, when you were doing your presentation, Jenny, I, I wondered, you know, what type of Medicaid or medical services was available to the individual that, you know, makes more than that $35,000 amount. So it sounds like this Medicaid work incentive would be one of those programs. Oops, your, your mic is off. Sorry, I clicked the button, but it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you um, are making more than the 35000 then MWIN is definitely the way to go to get medical insurance. Okay, great. And Hunter says, thank you so much. That answered my question perfectly. This has been very informative. Um, Kelly Coffin asks Richard, if an individual has previously benefited from DRS in obtaining their bachelor's degree, does that mean they can no longer access services from DRS? Oh, it's a great question. And, and the answer is it depends. Um, so um, just like everything I mentioned, all of our services are very uh, unique and individualized to uh, each person's needs. So again, it really does depend on what the situation is. Did, did the individual achieve their bachelor's degree and, and have some type of change in their life or did their job duties change? Um, so, so really, again, it just depends. We have to look at, is there, is there a need for additional training connected with their, their disability? Um, and it also depends on uh, policies and procedures at the time. And sometimes those things do change. Um, so it's always best just to check with your local office. Uh, anyone can apply for services. So if you think that, that um, there's, a, there's a need uh, to do that, I would just encourage you to, to reach out and, and, and check or call someone so we can figure out the situation, uh, you know, more uh, on an individual basis to talk about, you know, what's going on and, and, and is, it, is it realistic for that individual to, to, to reapply for services. I know that's not the, a definite yes, no answer, but, but that's my answer. It, it depends. Kelly, I hope that answers your question. It sounds like it's just an individualized case-by-case -case scenario. So it really it would, it would, it's always helpful to circle back and to, to determine what the needs are, the new needs or the needs are at the time, sounds like. So Kelly, let us know if that answers your question. And then um, Kimberly Purdue asked the question, I work with APS and had a client in an ICF group home that had an ABLE account. He passed away about a year ago. What do we need to do to get that account transferred to his brother next of kin who is also in ICG group home. We were and are full guardians for both clients. So reach out to me and I will send you a link to the form that you can complete and that you would submit to stable accounts. Um, additionally, we can reach out to stable account customer service directly for specific steps. I know that there's certain documentation that you'll have to um, provide, you know, the death certificate, and things like that, but there is a process in place that stable account has in order to transfer the ABLE account um, to another eligible um, sibling of the event account beneficiary. I'm more than happy to help you walk through those steps, so just shoot me an email and then I will um, be happy to follow up with you. And so, Kimberly, I hope that answers your question. Um, also, just know on a side note, as it relates to WBABLE accounts, you know, when you go to our website and you're at the resources tab, you'll see stable account forms. There is a list of numerous forms that are there to assist individuals in different processes, whether it be um, changing an authorized legal representative, um, whether it be setting up payroll direct deposit, whether it be making a check contribution, there's a form that you would submit with that. So just wanted to add that piece as well. So do we have any other questions at this time or even comments about um, today's webinar and, and the information that you've heard? And I'm gonna throw out there as well that I, you know, we are celebrating Disability Employment Awareness Month. And 
you know, Steve Wiseman has done a ton of work in this area on the policy, on the advocacy side of things. And, you know, as far as any closing remarks or final remarks, you know, from our panelists, but especially Steve Wiseman, which the last name is so appropriate. Um, Steve, um, for those of you that are not aware, he is retiring soon from his position at the Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, he's, he won't be replaced. Um, he will be incredibly missed, but I, I want to definitely always tap into the experience and knowledge that he has. And so here's another opportunity that I'm going to take advantage of, you know, just, just your insights and just any, any um, closing remarks on, you know, next steps and what you would like to, you know, to continue to see happen in this area for individuals. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I uh, certainly privileged to be here, part of uh, this panel. Uh, people I've known and worked with for quite a while. I think, uh, Roxanne, we can talk later. I think if we do the math again, uh, since I had this is my 49th year uh, working with people with developmental disabilities, um, and uh, we might find it. We actually well, that number that 80 number is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, it's it's uh, hopefully it's not just about uh, being on the payroll and sitting in a seat that long. Uh, we've got some uh, great people here who are leaders in their own areas and uh, really uh, combined leadership that really is great promise for the future. I told uh, staff and, and people myself, because it's time, you know, we move on at time that uh, I really see great things in the next five years. I, I, there are so much untapped uh, possibilities. Uh, when it, you know, listen to Jennifer and how many people, if they really understood what she was discussing, I mean, from the standpoint of, oh, I get it. Um, how many people would have that probably set aside as far as a barrier, you know, the fear that people still have <clears throat> that they're gonna lose benefits that are so critical to people. Um, the ABLE program, uh, we're just, I've said this before, it's one of the most monumental things for helping people with disabilities to truly make that jump into uh, employment. And uh, not just any employment or work, but you know, ones that are really valued and ones that person values. Um, I think uh, we we know the numbers. We know how many more people could poss could certainly benefit. They're not there yet. Uh, the ABLE board is very active. I'm very proud to be part of that and with the council. Um, I, I just think that it's, I just expect it has to click in all of our efforts. And um, again, it's great to be with the at Disability Rights West Virginia. Uh, besides the other panelists, uh, because there's a lot of um, a lot of interested and concerned people out there, um, and not have to be affiliated with an agency or, a, or an advocacy group or whatever, just individuals themselves. I look for great things ahead. Um, however, I might be able to help. I really would like to do that. But thank you very much for the privilege of being here and and to be with everybody today. Thank you, Steve, and. We, we can't thank you enough for all that you've done in the many decades. Um, you know, we have one minute left and do we have any other closing remarks? I don't see any more questions. Any more closing remarks from our panelists? Don't y'all love it when I put you on the spot? <laughs> see, I can do that when, when I'm in this seat. So just don't do it to me, okay? <laughs> So I just want to, you know, thank Disability Rights of West Virginia, thank the Developmental Disabilities Council for hosting this webinar, as well as our webinar series. Um, for those of you um, not aware that we do have three other webinars that were available on demand at the, um, the website that I referenced before, the resources tab. Um, thank you to Roy Mallory with Disability Rights of West Virginia. He is always so gracious to set this um, webinar up for us um, via the Zoom platform, and then also provide all of his technical expertise to make this possible. And then thank you to Ashley, who does a wonderful job at sign language interpreting for us. And then our panelists, um, 
you all do wonderful work and it's just an honor to partner with you all you know in my role with wv able and just look forward to um many more years of of, of working alongside to help get this information in the hands of the folks that need it and to help clear up the myths and the misconceptions because there are a lot of them just like um, steve mentioned with you know the WIPA and and you know trying to understand you know division of rehab services and crps and how everything is just so intertwined and so thanks to all of our attendees for participating and joining us today you know as we celebrate um the developmentals um um the disability employment awareness month and so um we are right at 131. And so again, thanks everyone. And this recording will be made, made available and it will be um, sent via email as once it's um, complete and then also a copy of the PowerPoint presentation as well. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day.